Hi, everybody. I'm Hector Garcia. I'm a CPA and a QuickBooks consultant, and I'm joined by my friend Alicia Katz Pollock, which I'll introduce in a minute. It is 1099 season. You're a small business owner or an accountant, and you have to file your 1099 forms for your independent contractors. And you're using QuickBooks Online, and they changed all the screens. <laughs> for the 2023 1099s that are going to be filed during January and some late filers in February of 2024, using QuickBooks Online, all the screens change, they were improved. And my go-to person for all things 1099 is Alicia, who's actually worked with the QuickBooks team to help them improve the product. So she's the actual author of the 1099 course that gets the most amount of people attending in January. And we'll, we'll talk about that towards the end. Um, but I want her to give me a preview in QuickBooks Online to give you a general idea of what that process looks like. So Alicia, thank you very much for coming in. You can share your screen, show us how 1099s in QuickBooks Online work. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me. Before I share my screen, I just want to say that I'm really excited about the new tools in QBO. As Hector said, I teach a class every single year on 1099s. And because I'm kind of the one helping the world know how to use it when Intuit realized that they had to actually address some of the issues that I've been complaining about. They brought me in to help actually design the new workflow. And so I'm really excited about, about it. So before I even begin, one of the first things to know is that the IRS has changed the filing requirements. And it used to be that you pretty much had the choice of paper or electronic filing, but now they've lowered the threshold down to 10 filings as a combined 1099s and W-2s. So if you have more than 10 employees and contractors in any combination, you have to file electronically. And that's where uh, QBO comes into play. So where I want to take you is there's a couple different ways of getting, getting there. You can go to expenses and contractors, or you can go to payroll and contractors. They give you two different ways of getting there, but they both lead to the contractor's screen. So when I go to contractors, it looks like this. Now, I actually teach a whole separate class just on the contractor screen. But what you're seeing right now on my screen is a list of all of the vendors that I have marked as track for 1099s when I was setting up the vendors. And it's a best practice that when you hire a contractor for the very first time, the best thing that you can do is have them fill in a W-9 form right when you pay them for the first time or when you first hire them. That way, you don't have to chase down the information that I'm about to show you that you have to chase. And one of the things that's really cool about the contractor center is that if you are missing a W-9 like this right here, you can actually send them, um, you can either fill it in or there's an option to send them uh, to fill in their own W-9 forms. And then that way you can request it and they can fill it in. And then it just says W-9 ready, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. So Alicia, you actually don't have to upload the physical W-9 they give you. Uh, what QuickBooks is saying is the W-9 information is in the system. So you don't have to upload a physical document. You just have to have the document. I mean, the, the data, the information about the contractor in the system, correct? Yeah. If you invite them through your QBO and if they fill in the form that basically, as you can see on my screen, you would send, put in their name and their email address and it sends them an invitation. And what that does is it sets them up with a free copy of QuickBooks self-employed where they fill in all of their name, address, contact information, EIN number or social security number, and they can use it as a QuickBooks file if they want to, but they don't have to. But what's nice for them is that gives them a hub for all of the people People who hire them and then they can just the next time somebody invites them they can just instantly send the information so like you said there's no form this way it's just a data transfer but you can also if you have a physical w9 form you can scan it or you have a pdf of it and you can attach it to your vendors so you're saying that one huge advantage of, of encouraging your vendors to use the self-serving system is if they have more than one customer, more than one client, right? not just you, but maybe they work with other companies that they're independent contractor for, they only have to fill the information once. And as long as they always use the same email, it's already sort of pre-saved in the profile. That, that's awesome. Isn't that awesome? I mean, ideally, if they're a subcontractor, they don't just have one client, they have many. So it's a huge time saver for them. Uh, 
Also in the subcontractors area, you also have the ability to work with them. You can track all of their payments and you can even pay them at, through here as well. If you have QuickBooks Online Payroll, you can use the direct deposit. And if you don't have payroll, you can actually pay to um, use the service to pay your contractors electronically. So totally cool. And then it dovetails really nicely with your 1099s. And if you're using QuickBooks, whether you pay them electronically or you write them physical checks or you do you know, direct wire transfers, however that you pay them, it doesn't matter whether you're doing paying them directly or paying them manually. As long as you're putting those payments in QuickBooks, you'll be able to do a 1099, whether it's all manual, all electronic or combined, correct? Exactly. And paying by paper check is so 2015. Paying electronically is so much easier. So um, let me go in and show you. So now pretend the whole year has gone by and it's December and you've got all of these vendors here and you, some of them, their W-9s are ready and some of them you've requested and they haven't filled them in yet. And everybody's got a different status. But let's go in and actually see the new 1099 wizard. So I'm going to click on prepare 1099s right here. And they used to call it the wizard. And so I still call it the wizard, even though they don't use that terminology anymore. So when you file your 1099s, you can see right here that at the top, they tell you what your deadlines are. So you can file between January 1st and May 7th. So even if you're late, you can still get your filings in. If you file by January 15th, it's actually a little cheaper. You can save yourself some money. And the last day to send the taxpayer copies is on the 28th, because when you use this wizard, it will both um, email and snail mail your contractors, their 1099 forms. So you, if to get their electronic copies or to get their paper copies by the 31st, that's your deadline right there, January 28th. Okay, in 2024. Okay, so then the first thing it does is it double checks your company information and your EIN number. This already came out of your settings, so it should already be there. If for some reason you skipped that setup step, you can enter it in right now and it updates your whole system. Once you've confirmed this information, you will click Confirm Info and Start Filing. Now, the first time you come in here, if you've never used it before, this screen is blank. Mine is populated because I've been using it. And what you do here is you specify which accounts you pay your subcontractors out of. And you want to be really thorough when you're looking at your chart of accounts and find any category that they might be in, even if you didn't use that category that year, it's better to be complete and let it eliminate than it is to skip something altogether. Like one year, I totally forgot my advertising and marketing and I had to re-go back and do all of my 1099s again for that category. So you can see here that I've got this big list. When you don't have any or when you want to add more, on the right-hand side, you've got select accounts. So I'll click select accounts, and this is where you can go in. And if you missed anything, you can go ahead and add anything else that might possibly be something from a subcontractor. And yell if you see anything that I might have missed. Most of these are things that would be corporations, you know, a in my class, I actually go into depth about who qualifies for a, a 1099, what categories you should use so that you're completely thorough. For this one, I'm going to just kind of pick some things. So I'm not really seeing anything else here. I think everything was picked at the first time so, around. So it's, it's safe to say that depending on the context on whether you are doing this for your own business, you already know your chart of accounts. You have a general idea what accounts you have used to pay your subcontractors. But let's say you're an accountant or somebody working with multiple clients, you have no idea what the chart of account looks like. So what you were fishing for is things that look like labor or help or contractor or subcontractor or mm -hmm. professional fees. Sometimes you see people hiding this contractor uh, payments on the professional fees. That's a and, big um, category. Yeah. yeah, it's a big category. And, um, and I assume you cover this more in your course because obviously your course is like almost two hours long and this video is like 20 minutes long. Right. But you have to do some troubleshooting and you have to kind of like go over all the payments being made to each contractor and do a quick review of what might be um, a, a 1099 able payment and what might not be. Because sometimes you can have a contractor that's charging you, let's say, 5000 for labor, but then $635 with 27 cents, they give you a receipt because it's an office supply reimbursement. 
and you would have to exclude that office supply reimbursement from the 1099. You know, this is, you know, I'm yeah. a CPA. Yeah. You know, this is like from my perspective. <laughs> that stuff becomes really nuanced and mm. complicated. So it's not always like best case scenario, just pick any account. No. You kind of have to give it some thought, don't you? Right. So so in the course, we're going to go in like depth, like who qualifies as a subcontractor versus an employee? How do you pay them? Does it that, you know, if you're paying by check or by ACH or by merchant services or by Zelle, we're going to go through all of that so that, you know, which payments qualify. We're going to talk about the thresholds of the $600 limit. We're going to talk about all of those, all of that detail. So, you know, exactly who's supposed to get one and who's not. And we're going to go into the categories that you generally find subcontractors in. So we will go into, into depth on all of that. Will um, you also go into the difference between 1099 NEC and yes. 1099 MISC? I'm about Could to. Could you give us, give us a 30-second Reader's Digest version of that? Sure, yeah. As, that's exactly where I was about to go right now. So once you have picked the categories where you might possibly have 1099 contractors in here, then what you do is you map it to the different boxes. And there's two different, um, let me go ahead and refresh my screen. It's not popping up. Um, there's two different forms that are in QBO's uh, system, the 1099 MISC and the 1099 NEC. It does not do other 1099s. There's no 1099K, there's no 1099B, the INT, any of those. It's just the two MISC and NEC forms. And then for each of the categories that you choose, you pick which form it goes on. So rent would be in a 1099 MISC, but most other categories fall under um, non-employee compensation on a 1099 NEC, non-employee compensation. And you know, back up until 2020, up until 2020, there was just one form. The MISC form had one box for NEC and almost everybody qualified for that. So that's why they broke it out into a different form with more detail. Now you'll notice that there's a couple other ones. There's direct sales, there's royalties, there's fishing boat proceeds, there's um, medical payments, there's gross proceeds paid to an attorney. We're in the course going to talk about exactly what that means. It doesn't necessarily mean your legal fees. So Again, for now, just know that you can map to any of the boxes on the NEC and on the MISC. So that's the next step. You go through, you've picked your categories, you go through and you map to the different boxes. Then once you have that, there's also, you can run a report of the accounts that are used. You can also run reports of the vendor payments so that you can scan all of these and do your due diligence and make sure you didn't miss anything. Now I'm going to click next and we're going to go on to the next screen. And so now what it does is it takes a look at the people who you have marked as being tracked for 1099s and who are not tracked for 1099s. So on the tab for tracked for 1099s, this is everybody who, when I set them up as a vendor, has the checkbox in the details for track for 1099, or I set them up using the contractor center, which automatically checks that box. So here are the people who have reportable payments, meaning that QBO has now gone through and done the due diligence. It has looked at the categories, who qualifies, how much you paid them, and what payment method that you used. And it whittles it all down into just the people who meet the threshold. So right now, it is only telling me that in reportable payments, meaning that it was paid by check or by ACH, and I paid them more than $600 in those categories that only came down with two people. If I drop this down, I have non-reportable payments. And so this one didn't happen to have anything. So good on that one. But now there's another tab here, not tracked for 1099s. And so that gives me an opportunity to look at everybody who isn't marked as a contractor and go, okay, wait a minute, they're supposed to get 1099s. Um, even though they didn't qualify, they're under 410, they still should be tracked just in case I paid them more. So I'll add them to the tracked list. And then this guy too, non-reportable total, $750. Let's go ahead and add him as well. So both of those people. And so I would now go through and anybody here who still qualifies as a 1099 vendor, meaning that they're either a sole proprietor or an LLC, 
They're not an S corp. They're not incorporated. It's usually an individual who is doing business. I would run through and I would add all of them to the track list. And I noticed that it, um, it gives you in little red markings. And I love that if you're missing the tax ID or if you're missing the address, because you actually need those three things. You need yes. the name of the person or company. Mm -hmm. You need the tax ID and you need the address. And since you open the kind of worms, kind of, by selecting that vendor that said Romania on the address, could you tell us a little bit about that? Like what if the vendor is outside of the United States? Yeah, this tool is only reporting for the United States. So if you have a, a, a people in other countries, you're going to need to go and do your research to find out if um, you're going to need to make payments to them through other means or not. Um, I just wanted to show you the non-reportable total that it would ex exclude it. Okay, so now what I want to do, I'm going to go back to reportable. And I've got missing information right here. So if I click on edit, it would give me a chance to go through and collect the rest of their information and go get their um, information and add it. So let me go in and put something in for here. And that's if the contractor didn't fill it in through the online system. That's if you elected to put it in yourself and you're waiting to get that information and transcribe it from the W9 that they gave you. Exactly. Yeah, it was interesting. If you actually put one, two, three, four, five, six, it knows it's a made up it, number. Right, let exactly. You <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight will automatically get excluded. Yeah. Okay. So this is your opportunity to do your due diligence now and look for people who are tracked and whether they qualified or not and people who are not tracked and should be tracked. So I consider this my research screen. This is where I go through and I double check absolutely everybody and make sure that I haven't left anybody out, haven't left out any payments. Maybe I go, oh, you know, I know I paid them more money. Oh, it was on my credit card. No wonder it didn't show up. And uh, so this is your chance to do all of your reviews. So and I want to just come, come into that really quick mm -hmm. um, because you said it sort of quick. It was on my credit card. No wonder it didn't show up. Um, this is because you only report 1099s to people that you don't pay through a credit card. Right. Because the credit card payment merchant processor, whatever the formal name for those type of companies is, the merchant processor, the credit card company, when they uh, deposit money into businesses from credit card payments, they report those payouts in a separate form called a 1099K, right. which you, you as a business owner don't have to file that. You only file the 1099 MISC or the 1099 NEC. Right. So when so, you pay them through a credit card, it's in your QuickBooks Online credit card. QuickBooks knows to exclude that, right? Right. So as you're running your expenses throughout the year, some of them are going to be expenses. And as long as you pay it through a credit card, it knows automatically to exclude it. You, anytime you pay from a third party payment processor, they're going to send their own 1099Ks to anybody who actually qualifies. And the, the qualifications, depending uh, on the processor, sometimes it's $20,000. But you're not responsible. You're only responsible for reporting the ones where you paid them directly. And again, we're going to go through that in that long hour and a half course. Perfect. Okay. So picking up with the, uh, with the 1099 vendor. So now I've done all my due diligence. I'm satisfied. I've got the right people, the right thresholds. I haven't overlooked anything. I click next. So now it wants to preview my forms. And I see here that I have two NEC twos. And if I had any MISC forms, and at this point, MISC is usually for rent, although you'll have some other people occasionally. And so I don't have any MISC forms to file, just two NECs. And then once I have filed, I would be able to find them under the filing complete tab. So there's nothing there right now because I haven't done it yet. So back to ready. So then I click next and then it would start the preview and I would click next again, and then this is where the filing comes in. And so it, it files to the IRS, but it does not file to the state. That's important to remember. And some states don't require you to file 1099s at all. Other states require you to file, and you can print out and file, but some require you to upload or go through their websites. So sometimes you might find some limitations. Could you go back for a second and show us a preview of one just so we can get an idea for what that looks like? Thank you. 
So okay. here's the electronic copy of the form, and it will also be mailed to the um, to the the contractor as well. So if you were using the contractor payments, um, then which is fifteen dollars a month, it includes ten ninety nines as part of the, the monthly package. If you are running payroll with payroll premium or higher, it also includes the 1099s as part of the package. You don't have to pay any extra money. If you are not using either of those two services, you can still use the system to e-file and it starts at $399 a form. There's discounts if you're before January 15th. Um, it, I think it goes up to $5 a form after the, um, after the 15th. And so you would then, once this is available, which at the, as of this recording, it's not available, but I will be able to demonstrate this when we teach the course, you would um, pick which one you are eligible for and then do your e-filing, at which point it would send the electronic copies, mail out paper copies, submit to the IRS, and boom, you're done. And so I love this wizard because it really makes it really streamlined and really easy to use. And if you're in a situation where for any reason this isn't going to work, the good news is that you can still use the 1099 wizard to kind of dial it in and make sure that you've got all your bases covered. And then if you, for some reason, do need to file with track 1099 or, 10, or tax 1099, it does integrate and will import your final data over to their platform. Some other things about this to know is that it also supports corrections. So if you made a mistake, you can resubmit. If you are doing corrections, you always have to do a correction using the same platform you used in the first place. So you would come right back here again to do it. Uh, and as you can see, it also remembered from last year, which were the categories that I've used. So you can also go in and see your histories of your past filings. So. Like I said, I'm pretty happy with the, the new system and I'm really looking forward to showing it off, showing you how to troubleshoot and have, going from the very beginning of what is a 1099 all the way through a filing. I love that, Alicia. Thank you for that. So I just want to remind you, uh, if you're watching this, that we recorded this in December and we're releasing this a couple of days before the end of the year because some people like to, to be one step ahead mm -hmm. and you can get started. You can go in there, you can select your vendors, prep your information, add your, your W9 information, your address, your tax IDs, you add all that stuff, uh, select the accounts that are being mapped correctly, like follow all the instructions from here. And then once the January 1st uh, the date happens, this, is, this screen would actually change a little bit mm -hmm. because it's no longer in sort of pre-filing prep mode. It's now ready to file mode. I, I am pretty certain they're not going to change the structure, like all the buttons that you press and all the tables will be the same, but uh, different than this screen, this is the, sort of the prep screen, you're going to be much more sort of um, structured towards actually filing, finishing the filing at the very end. And like Alicia exactly. said, you have, you have two choices. You can just pay per form, depending on how many contractors you have, one time fee, and that's it. And it starts at $4 a form. $5 a form after this uh, January 15th. That's what Intuit charges. That's what mm -hmm. QuickBooks charges. Or you can elect to pay $15 a month, not a form, a month from now until forever. <laughs> so so right. you can have both uh, electronic payments to contractors moving forward, having the ability to do uh, 1099s, and it covers up to 20. So you have to do your own calculation in terms of economics. If you want to combine this service of 1099s and also electronic payments, or just one time a year come in and pay per form. Exactly, exactly. Uh, and Alicia, tell us, tell us more about your course. So you're covering 1099s. So what didn't you cover in today's video? Let's just go through a couple bullet points. And then yeah. what else? Because it's not just 1099s, it's payroll, time tracking, there's a whole bunch of stuff. So yeah. tell us a little bit about that. So I like to get everybody to start the year off right, and especially beginning of the year is not only 1099 season, but it's the time when a lot of people actually switch their payroll processors. And so I'm doing a, a package of courses that I'm doing the 1099s course on January 9th. I'm doing on January 16th, a QuickBooks time and payroll course, which is how to use QuickBooks time for your time tracking for your employees and manage their, their time off. 
and their schedules uh, so that it imports into QuickBooks Payroll. So I'm gonna be demonstrating how to track your employees' time and run a payroll. And every February or March, I also update my QuickBooks Payroll course. And so right now I have an on-demand recording of it and we're going to actually bundle all three of these together for you. Um, and so you can take the 1099s class the QuickBooks time class and get access to the the payroll course all as one bundle. And as a bonus, when I re-record that payroll class um, in a few months, you'll actually get the updates to that one as well. Uh, that's awesome. So in January, you're updating the 1099 course to include what the second piece of this looks like, mm -hmm. the actual e-filing. What happens before, which is prepping the file, making sure all the contractors are set up correctly and all the payments are set up correctly and reclassifying and putting the payments on where they're supposed to be mapped, not mapped, all that stuff. And then there's time tracking, which you can do both for contractors and employees, but time tracking is mostly tied to payroll, correct? Well, you can use it with your contractors as well. Okay. Oh, so you could turn your, yeah. so you can have contractors track time with QuickBooks time and then turn that into, into checks in QuickBooks. Exactly. Oh, that's awesome. It is okay. awesome. And, and to be clear, it's a one-time fee for the course and it includes all the updates. So you don't have to pay like per month or anything like that. No, not only is it a one-time per course, but when I teach it again in the following year, you'll actually get the updated videos for them too. So if there are additional changes to the software, you'll find out. And if somebody's watching this, let's say after you record this live or even after the January 31st deadline for 1099s <laughs> and you're filing late, uh, could you access the course uh, after the fact? Absolutely. All of our courses are not just live webinars, but they're available on demand um, afterwards. So you can watch the videos, you can slow it down, you can speed it up, you can watch it over and over again. There's a class discussions board. So if you have questions, you can ask and CPE credit as well. So if you need continuing education or CPE credits, you do get CPE for taking these courses. That's amazing. And is there like a, a deal? Can you put like a discount for our, our viewers? Yeah, I can do that. I'd be happy to give you a discount code. Awesome. Okay. You send me that. I'll put that in the description below. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks everybody for watching this. I hope that you have an awesome 1099 season and thank you, Alicia, for coming on and showing us how it works. Thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure to be here and I will see you all in class. Bye-bye.